surprise. I'm with the TV star today. Vinny Rotino makes his return to Locked On Brewers. All right, one half is done, Vinny. Uh, there's a lot of directions we can go. Obviously, haven't had a podcast since Friday and the Josh Hader meltdown. We can talk about the Valk. We can talk about the 9-5 loss on Sunday. But this is going to be more about the overall first half and our impressions, what we're looking forward to in the second half and things like that. We are live from San Francisco right now, so – uh, you may hear the music and everything in the background happening right now. But first and foremost, before we actually talk about the Brewers, Vinny, you just knocked out four games or three games of television with Valley Sports Wisconsin doing live color. How'd that feel, man? You did a great job. Man, I appreciate it, Dom. No, I mean, it was um, it was quite the experience. I've never done color commentary before other than when you and I have done the, those practice broadcasts. And that obviously really, really helped in my debut as a, as a color analyst. And then obviously BA the best in the business guy to work with. Uh, he kind of held my hand through the whole thing. And then Dan Keener was the producer. So he did a tremendous job of holding my hand through the, through it all. But it was, it was quite the experience, a lot of fun, which the Brewers could have won a couple of more games, but uh, you know, it was a lot of fun. At least you won the first one. So it can't all really be on you for this, you know, one in three trip uh, here in San Francisco. What was something that maybe caught you by surprise as in both good and bad way? Like, wow, I didn't expect this to happen to me on television and slash like, oh, I re reacted to something that happened a lot differently than maybe you would have expected to happen. Uh, you know what? I honestly, just the idea um, of reacting and staying in the moment during replays. I didn't know. I, I thought I did fairly well on the replays and just kind of describing what was happening in, in the game. Um, and the first one right off the bat was a Luis Arias play to his backhand. And I, I felt like I called it pretty good, but I, I didn't know, you know, um, I was, it was just talking baseball really Dom at the end of the day and, and BA, like I said, and you even in the booth just made me feel comfortable that at the end of the day, we're just talking baseball. And that's, that's what, uh, what was good about it. Other than what was a surprise of it was, um, you know, you have to stay locked in the entire time. I mean, it takes a lot of concentration. I actually actually really tip my cap to guys like you that do play-by-play -play and BA. Um, you are concentrating for all nine innings for the four hours or however long baseball games are. It takes a lot of work. So now that we're done schmoozing about how good he did on television, now let's get back to reality. The Brewers are 50 and 43 at the, at the All-Star break. If I told you in April, no context at all, 50 and 43 and in first place. I'm not going to tell you how many games up you are. I'm going to say, hey, you're going to be 15, 43 in first place. How would you react? Yeah, I mean, that would obviously you would be pretty excited about that. Um, but I, you know, giving the context of where I know that how, where this team was until where the team is now, it's a little bit different um, knowing that the team was off to the best start in franchise history through the first 50 games. And then they finished, obviously, not great. So um, in the first half, but some takeaways that they are getting healthier is kind of, kind of the takeaway for me, but at the end of the day, you wish they uh, would have built up a little bit better record uh, and, and been a little bit better. What are they? Seven games over 500 at this point. I, I would have thought they would have been better than that. And to your point about, you know, 50 games in, there was so much excitement and getting healthier. I think is an important thing to note because they were healthy majority for that first 50 games, you can really point to right around game 50 is when Willie got hurt, Kutch goes down the COVID IL, uh, you start having injuries pop up on this team. And I think the biggest blow to this team is Freddie Peralta right now. And that's an easy branch, you know, to, to grab onto. But when you see, and this is no disrespect to Jason Alexander and Aaron Ashby, but when you see uh, they're still developing, I mean, Ashby's only 24 years old and Yes, Freddie's not that much older than either one of those guys, but you can just see what four big league seasons can do to a player in development. And you've been on that side of baseball before. Do, do you? Do, am I making sense? Is, is yeah. that something? No, it's one hundred percent. I mean, look, Aaron Ashby. Does he have a year in the big leagues? I don't even know if he's got a year at this point in the big leagues. And experience as a starter, he's still developing. I am. I think we're on the same page. Like, this guy is going to be an all-star at some point. I mean, the stuff is just too good. He's going to learn how to put guys away with two strikes. He's going to learn where to command the baseball in certain situations. He just hasn't gotten there yet. It's more stuff than anything right now. Jason Alexander is a guy that's really got a – he's been a nice addition 
at times with getting innings. Um, today he got, he got hit around. I mean, it's just lefties really are having a really easy time with him. He's going to have to make some adjustments there. Freddie Peralta is 100% the biggest blow to this team at this point, not only because of his performance, but because of his ability to lead in that clubhouse. And he is, and he is still young, but he is a leader. That energy that he brings, it's similar to Willie Adamas um, in that the more guys you can get like that, the better you're going to be. Uh, and and the, the, a guy like that really just cares about winning. He really is just passionate about winning, and that is infectious. And that's what's been taken away from this team from ever since he was um, you know, put on the aisle. And for this team to be where they're at, again, only seven games over 500 after that great start, but then when you add in the context, which is what we didn't do, they're only a half game up because the Cardinals were postponed yesterday. So they still enter the half at, up in, in the, the division. And when you add in the context, you're thinking to yourself, well, when they start putting it together on the pitching side of things, which was what their expectation was to be good at, when you're losing Peralta, when you lost Woodruff for a little while there, now you're, you've lost Hauser for a little while, and he's on his way back. He's begun his throwing program. I think the context is really important to note as far as, you know, yes, they're only seven games over 500 right now, but you know they haven't played their best baseball yet, aside from those first 50 games. They haven't had their full unit really available on the pitching side. They're now getting the offense back. Renfro is starting to hit the ball hard again. I, I just see that the context and explaining the folks who maybe look at the Brewers record and say, oh, my gosh, they're only 50 and 43. How did that happen? And it's like, well – this is what happened. And you had a great point about the injuries that the Brewers did not have to deal with that last season that you got into the broadcast uh, in yesterday's show, like the, how little the, the Brewers dealt with injuries. It was a total anomaly year for the Brewers last year. And the fact that they didn't have guys go down with arm injuries, they had some guys go on the COVID list, but those were only two week IL stints for the Brewers last year. And look, they had six guys essentially, including Brett Anderson, who ate a bunch of innings. Um, and that keeps your bullpen fresh. And it also keeps your, your starting pitching rotation really crisp and fresh in the way that they can go out and execute on a daily basis. Um, I think once the second half hits, you made some really good points there, Dom. You, you also have Andrew McCutcheon that is swinging the bat really well. You have that Hunter Renfro starting to swing it. Rowdy Telez is a guy that's been streaky, but again, he's still developing as a major league player. Um, as an everyday major league player, really hasn't had that opportunity until this year. He's going to continue to get better. Willie Adamas is going to make some adjustments. You know that. He's just got to stay a little bit more consistent. So I think you and I were talking off camera, and I, I believe what you said. Like This team is, has, a, has a chance. They're poised to make a, a run and just let, rattle off 10 in a row. They really can do that. They're capable of doing that. They have the guys. They have the talent to do so. We're just kind of waiting on them to do it. Um, this was a tough series here coming into San Francisco. This could have gone either way, and it, it didn't go their way, and it looks way worse than it actually is. Um, but uh, it was a tough-fought series the first three games. Obviously, today they just got flat-out beat. I, I look at August right now as I'm scrolling ahead right now on the uh, Brewers' schedule. So coming out of uh, the trading deadline on August 2nd, the Brewers have three games in Pittsburgh, three games at home against the Reds, two games at home against the Rays, and then three on the road in St. Louis. So quite frankly, when you add up all, what is that, five, eight, 11 games, and I know the last time I said, hey, you should be expecting seven and three, you look at those 11 games after the Boston series of saying, okay, can you prove it? And it can rattle off a run right there because that's going to be your team after August 2nd, looking Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Tampa Bay, and St. Louis, and obviously only seven more games head-to-head -head with St. Louis, which will matter because – as we look at the standings right now in baseball at the half, right now the second, uh, to all of our surprise, the second uh, the second place team in the Central is currently in a wild card spot, which we talked about that a lot in the preseason shows of like, oh, there's there's no shot that's going to happen. St. Louis is in a tie for the last wild card spot with Philadelphia. They're virtually equal in winning percentage despite being different in total wins. San Francisco is a half game back of that last spot. So there is an outside possibility you still make it into the postseason as a wild card team. But let's be honest, you don't even want to entertain that thought. With these seven games head to head left with St. Louis, you got to treat it like it's an NLCS. Got to win those seven and see what you can do the rest of the year, right? Yeah, you definitely got to beat St. Louis best you can. And you got to take care of business against those other teams that you should beat, like Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, that are upcoming on the schedule as well. Those are wins that you need to have. Hopefully, 
then you can play a little bit better than 500 baseball against those playoff caliber teams, and that should get it done. However, you never want to take St. Louis for granted. They have an offense that can rattle off a bunch of wins as well, and they have a starting pitching staff that, you know, isn't as good as the Brewers, but, you know, you just do not want to sleep on the Cardinals at the end of the day. And like you said, you know, you, at the end of the day, you're going to have the Dodgers. They're running away with the West. You got the Mets, I believe, is going to run away with the East. And then you have whoever wins the Central, that second place team is going to be battling for their life against, let's say, the Phillies and San Francisco. And those are the teams or, or the Padres if they fall out of it as well in that wild card race. So it's going to be fun to watch. You just want, you just don't want it to be fun for the Brewers. You want them to lock up that central and move on to the playoffs. And the thing with that, as I look at all the standings right now, you can specifically say for most of these teams, they've got something exciting coming back. Now the Dodgers don't know what they're going to get out of Walker Bueller, and he's not even going to throw for very long in September when he returns, but they will be getting Chris Taylor back. Bellinger has been getting warmer. Freddie Freeman's been incredible. They're going to, I believe they're still going to be the one seed. That's not exactly a hot take. The Mets, Jacob DeGrom. He's going to be due back right after the all-star break. The Brewers, obviously Freddie Peralta and Adrian Hauser coming back. Then you look at the Padres, most exciting player in baseball, Fernando Tatis Jr. is due back. He's starting a hitting progression this week. But then you look at teams like Atlanta and St. Louis and Philadelphia. They kind of are who they are. It's not like there's someone crazy coming back. Tyler O'Neill just returned for the Cardinals, but, they kind of are who they are. There's no one waiting in the wings for them. So that's where I think the Brewers take it a little advantage of like, well, they're going to get better down the stretch. And there's got to be calls being made right now by David Stearns and Matt Arnold about talking, hey, you know, we're at, at this very moment, three weeks, less than three weeks away from the trade deadline. So that's the kind of thing that the Brewers are really good at. Yeah, they are good at adding pieces. But like you said, Atlanta is good at – you saw Atlanta just basically revamp their entire team last year at the trade deadline and then went off to win the World Series. You know Dombrowski's going to do the same thing in Philadelphia. He's going to sell the farm in order to make them a playoff contender because he does not care about the future. He's going to leverage it and go after it. So those two teams in particular are going to get a lot better. Fernando Tatis Jr. coming back scares me about the San Diego Padres with their pitching staff and how good they are. Um, and so, yeah, you definitely want to make sure that you take care of business in the central. And then, yeah, you also want to make sure that you at least entertain the idea of adding a couple of pieces so that you can compete for that central and win the central flat out. And I think the, the fun part, too, with this second half schedule, we've talked about it at nauseum. 21 of the last 26 games are at home. So you have that going for you. But to be fair. Six of those games are against the New York Yankees and New York Mets, who will be front running in their respective divisions. But aside from that, you've got St. Louis coming to town for two more at the end of this end of the season, Miami for four and Arizona for three. So you, your last seven games will be against non playoff teams, but you'll have two more with St. Louis at the very, very end there of that last homestand of the season. So that's looking way, way ahead. Let's kind of step back here for a second and look at some actual numbers from the Brewers here in the first half. Uh, no surprise, but Corbin Burns has been another Cy Young candidate. He finishes the first half 7-4 and four with a 2.14 ERA, 113 innings, 144 strikeouts. Now, I'm going to go live here onto uh, Baseball Reference. I'm just going to go ahead and take a peek real quick at his 2021 first half. How different is this from his 2021 first half? In 2021, he went 4-4. Four and four, with a 2.36 ERA, so by .08 of an ERA more this season. Uh, strikeouts, he has more strikeouts in more innings this year because of the uh, All-Star break. He had three more starts at the break this year than he did last year. He also had a, a bout with COVID coming out, out of the All-Star break too last year. So Corbin Burns is virtually on the same level he was last year, and yet somehow he's kind of considered third billing in Cy Young because of what Sandy Alcantara is doing right now. I, I don't know if we... It's kind of hard to just say, hey, this guy's good, but this guy's good. Like, are we recognizing that enough? I mean, this guy is really good. I mean, we talked to, we talked to the Giants broadcasters as well, and Dwayne Kuyper even said, like, this guy is the best in the business after watching him live. That first game of the series just shut down the San Francisco Giants. I mean, he can shut down lefties. He can shut down righties. And, and remember, last year, those numbers you're talking about, he, that was in a six-man rotation. He's taking the ball now every fifth day for this Brewers team, and he has answered the bell – He's answered any question whether or not he can do that, and he's answered that and then some. And so um, it's just it's just remarkable what he's been able to do. He's definitely going to be in the running for Cy Young. 
um, again this year. I just want to remind folks, too, of looking at the names on this pitching staff that you might have forgotten through an inning for the Brewers this year. Uh, remember when Jose Urania broke camp for the Brewers in April? And, you know, now he's with the Rockies and pitching well. Good for him. Uh, you also had Pierre Strezlecki fill in. Ethan Small made that spot start in Chicago. Uh, Luis Perdomo has been hurt. Sounds like he's not going to be pitching anytime soon. Uh, Trevor Kelly filled in some innings. He's back in AAA now. Uh, Luke Barker had to fill in a few innings, but he's back in AAA too. But it's just that every team goes through these waves of, of health. And now you've got Connor Sadzek up in the big leagues. Jake Cousins going to start throwing again. There's more re reinforcements coming on the bullpen side of things too, but nothing is ever perfect when it comes to health wise. But now looking over to the offense, things are looking healthy again. Renfro goes yard team leader in homers. It is a uh, Willie Adamas, which I think is surprising given he missed three weeks. Let's try to speaking of, wow, this guy is good. Can we help explain to folks why we're excited about a guy that's hitting 220 with 19 homers? Why is he so important to the Brewers and, when you ha when somebody asks, well, the dude's only hitting 220. What's so great about him? What does Willie Adamas bring to this Brewers team and what he's done in this first half? Well, I mean, you know, we talk all the time about what he brings to the team in terms of leadership, in terms of passion and energy, and what makes him great on that side of things. But when he hits, the Brewers win. I mean, in their Brewer wins, I mean, it is remarkable the difference. He's got over a 900 OPS in Brewer wins, and then in Brewer losses, like a 500 OPS. So, when he hits, the Brewers win. I know he hit a home run in the last game of the series against San Francisco, and the Brewers ended up losing. Um, but when Willie goes, the team goes. And that goes for also Hunter Renfro and Rowdy Telez. But he's been super – he's been so important. He always comes up with big hits as well. He's hitting 220 on the season, but he is hitting closer to 270 with runners in the scoring position. This guy elevates his concentration, his focus when runners are in, in scoring position. He's always seeming to come up with a big hit. And for Willie, too, he's going to be officially on the run. He's 10 homers away from tying the Brewers' single-season record for homers by a shortstop held by no other than the kid, Robin Yount. So uh, that's going to be really, really fun to watch down the stretch. Yount did that, of course, in 1982. If Willie can do that, if he gets to 30 homers as a shortstop, every single team would take notice of that and understand me. There's a reason he's batting second on this team. I know Rowdy's hit a slump here down the end of the first half. I don't know if it's fatigue uh, induced, but yet he's still got the second best OPS among full-time players on the team for the Brewers with a 763 OPS while playing great first base defense. Rowdy, 88 games this year. That is the tied for the most on the team with Christian Yelich. He's played 88 of the 93 games. He has truly been given the opportunity to be an everyday player. What would you assess his first half? Now, he's a very impactful player. Um, obviously, when he's swinging it good, the Brewers, just like Willie Adamas, the Brewers' offense goes when, when Rowdy Telez is in there. He's that big presence in the lineup. I think it's affected him that Rowdy Telez has actually been hurt this year, um, and, and it's it just affected him because then he doesn't have any protection in the lineup. So when he gets that, he hits. I do think it's a little bit of a, a f fatigue factor because of, um, you know, you, because of the slump that he has recently been in. He also went in a little bit of a slump earlier, too. I think, too, this guy is going to continue to improve those long stretches where he, where he goes without hits, right? I think he, that is his next level, that next step in his development where he kind of limits those times, makes quicker adjustments. Again, I consider this his rookie season almost, right? Because this is his first opportunity to play every day. He got the he got the job last year after the All Star break against the White Sox around July 23rd when he was handed over the everyday job at first base. So now um, it's a little bit past that one year mark, I believe, or right under just past it. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think he's going to continue to develop and get better. Uh, let's get ready to wrap this up with just a few, I guess, Brewers questions. Looking ahead, how do we feel about this? And the most pressing question right now is, are you worried about Josh Hader? And that's what everyone's talked about. And uh, I personally am not worried about Josh Hader. Uh, I believe this break will be great for him, getting some time back at home, hit the mental reset button. Now, if he comes back and this happens again, I'm not saying gives up six runs, but I'm saying loud contact, not getting swings and misses, maybe start to scratch your head. But I want him to prove me wrong again to show me that, you know, oh, he's not going to fix this because he has fixed this. Kurt Hogg actually has some great tweets about it uh, on uh, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and talking about his Twitter account or on Kurt Hogg's Twitter of saying, haters gone through slumps like this before. 
And every single time he's bounced back. So I pose the question to you. Should we be worried about Josh Hader? No, he's like you say, he's went, he's gone through this before in 2019 in particular, there was a stretch in August where he gave up a bunch of runs in consecutive outings and he's given up 15 home runs. He gave up 15 home runs that year as well in 2019. I think he's just going to have to make some adjustments. I think it's just a matter of his location. I do think the finish on his pitches isn't as crisp, especially the slider. Uh, the location has been right down the middle at times, and that's where he's been got been getting hurt. Um, the fastball, Joey Bart's a great fastball hitter, and he was able to turn it around the other night. Uh, and then and then Yastrzemski as well. I think that ball was right down the middle. And again, I just think he was kind of beaten down a little bit mentally in, in that last outing where uh, the bases were loaded. He just kind of served one up to Yastrzemski. So, so I, I definitely think he's going to work out of this. And I, and I say that with confidence because we saw on Tuesday he went three up, three down with three punch outs and totally dominated against the Minnesota Twins. So it's still in there. He'll be fine. Uh, as we're recording this, the draft is actually happening right now. Uh, we're not waiting for the Brewers pick to do this, so you'll already know the Brewers pick. But the first overall pick was Jackson Holiday out of Stillwater, Oklahoma, switch hitting shortstop. Uh, the Orioles draft him first overall, so congratulations to Jackson Holiday, Drew Jones went second overall to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Yes, Andrew's son. And the Rangers wow. just selected Kumar Rocker, third overall. Uh, wow. They're going heavy on the pitching, and he's now reunited with his former Vanderbilt teammate, Jack Leiter, and now the Pirates are currently on the clock right now. But I thought I found that pretty uh, fascinating. But it leads me to my next point about the draft and that the Brewers are about to have, you know, a little bit of life injected into their farm system. And it leads me to the trade question. Do the Brewers have enough in their farm system right now to go get the bat that it seems like they really do need? Juan Soto? Are they gonna- <laughs> What's your Juan Soto package? <laughs> My Juan Soto package is empty the whole holster to get them. I don't know if I would actually do it. Jackson Chirillo would obviously need to be in there. Basically, all three guys that were in the Futures game would probably have to be in that package to even start the conversation. I don't know if the Brewers would do that. I don't know if I, I would do that either. Juan Soto does put you over the hump in terms of a bat and perhaps win the World Series with him. Otherwise, the other name would be a Brian Reynolds, which Bryce Terang and Jackson Trio would also have to be in that package, or a Joey Weimer would have to be in that package to get him with two and a half years of control left, and he can play center field. So I would think about it. I don't know if I would do it. Yeah, I don't think, I, I don't think it's worth it to go all in on a year that your pitching isn't quite healthy. Uh, you don't really have enough in your farm system because – if you go all in this year, your farm system is going to have a long road to recovery for the next three, four years because it already is in the bottom five as things stand right now. Uh, and then lastly, the Brewers will win the Central if – and you fill in the blank. My fill in the blank is the Brewers will win the Central not so much if they hit more, but I believe the Brewers win the Central if they get consistent starting pitching from their three, four, five guys, not the Burns and Woodruff. If Peralta comes back healthy and strong – if Hauser rebounds into just 2021 version of Adrian Hauser, not needing him to be lights out. And Eric Lauer, he's been rounding back into form as of late. I look at those three guys. If they round back in the form, that's why the Brewers win the Central. What about you? No, I agree with that. I'll just take a little bit of, of a different take. The Brewers win the Central if Devin Williams continues this dominance and Josh Hader gets back to being Josh Hader. I think that that gets it done with the starting pitching that they have. They have just a small bridge in the middle of the game to get to those two guys. When they're that dominant, they win a lot of close games. They've been losing a lot of a lot of close games lately. They're going to enjoy this break, and we are too. Vinny, it's good to reunite with you finally back here on the podcast. Absolutely. I can't wait till the offseason where I can get back on, Dom. <laughs> exactly. This man is just as busy as me, so uh, he's got a, a bus and a charter to catch. It must, must be nice. Some of us fly coach. <laughs> All right? Don't Don't forget us little people down here, okay? <laughs> You'll be there soon enough, Tom. Don't yeah, worry. And soon enough. It's all good. I can't complain. I've been doing TBS games too. But uh, that's Vinny. I'm Dom. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, got the interview with Lane Grindle dropping tomorrow. And I got another guest. Uh, I don't want to tease it yet, but I think you're going to really, really like this guest coming up later in the week. Uh, that episode will drop on Friday. I do not want to reveal who that guest is yet. But uh, again, Vinny joins us today. We had Lane Grindle coming tomorrow. Uh, and then we'll have a few more pods this week. Stay tuned to our Twitter to see all the schedule at Locked On Brewers. Until next time, keep on swinging.